We are thrilled to have Angela Myers join us as our keynote speaker today. And she arrived at the airport uh, in Wisconsin. She lives in Iowa, but she arrived at an airport in Wisconsin yesterday at 11 to catch her flight. She stayed it until 9 or 10. At one point, as they were rebooking her flight, she was going to have to fly through the night, and she was going to arrive at 5. And she was willing to make that trip, that journey, to be with us here today, but didn't make one of her connections. So uh, you go to plan two, like any teacher, and that's to connect with her via Blackboard Collaborate. So uh, we, her files have quickly been loaded in Blackboard Collaborate, and she'll join us in, in a moment. But let me tell you a little bit about Angela. She is a teacher. She taught kindergarten. She taught eighth grade. And she has, she's also an author. She has written a number of books. She's written one book about that's entitled Habitudes or something to the effect, which is basically the habits that you want to cultivate in students. She wrote another one on teaching to kids' passions in terms of uh, building on their interests in instruction. Perhaps her biggest impact that she has felt is through the, connecting with people through the use of social media. There are a number of metrics for measuring folks and their impact in, on different fields, and she is, I believe, number one person in the world in terms of impact on education through social media. And a key part of this success is her, is, is she has shared a You Matter message in terms of talking about the importance of the role that everybody can play and the gifts that they can contribute. So I'm incredibly pleased to have Angela join us um, today via Blackboard Collaborate. And what we're going to do is just go ahead and turn over the, turn over the mic to Angela. So welcome, Angela. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Oh, you can hear me, and I can see you. I'm so happy. This is using technology right. It, it wouldn't have happened even just a few years ago that the airlines would have still messed up, but I wouldn't have been able to be with you today. And it's just extraordinary that this is physically happening, that I get to hear your opening remarks and your wonderful words, Eric. And I'm just going to repeat a couple of them. You, this story is just getting started, and the work that you are doing is so important. It matters, and you matter. So have you had them tell each other that this morning, Eric? I can't hear him back. Um, so give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me. We all help. You can. Great. It's and so Angela, I'm... to talk to people who can't talk back. <laughs> can you make this work on my husband? <laughs> just teasing, just teasing. Um, Eric asked me to speak about the decisions that will be coming up as it relates to technology, learning, and most importantly, making a local, national, and global impact. And so I put together a framework that I want to share with you today. But I, just a few days ago, I was with my, and my slides aren't working. So um, Eric, can you make these, oh, there it goes. Can you, can you see my little niece, Olivia? Just keep giving me a thumbs up. Okay, good. So this is what makes education and also being an aunt um, a get to do is that when you hang around really young kids, everything is awesome to them. Every single thing is awesome to them. Breathing is awesome. Grass is awesome. The sky is awesome. Milk is awesome. And as you move throughout your life, things look a little less awesome. They become ordinary. They become so part of your being that you think, oh, that's just average, when in fact it actually is awesome, like what we're doing today. as average as it may be to many of you who have been on Illuminate, who have used technology to connect, when technology becomes so immersed in what you're doing, you forget to sit back and see life like a three-year-old, where you wake up with, this is what we call the Olivia face, where you wake up with the Olivia face and you go to bed with the Olivia face, because we really are living not just in exponential times, but in awesome times. What does not keep the wow on your face is a tool. 
That's a temporary awesome. Olivia isn't smiling from the inside out. I'm not smiling from the inside out because we're using illuminate or possibly ridicule or yeto or social oom for all the million tools that are out there. That makes me smile for just a moment, but it is the human possibility, the ability to be living and breathing in this time where I get to do this with people like you. And I get to do this with amazing kids like Olivia that make me smile. Unfortunately, most of our staff development, we're trying to wrap the awesome around the tool. And so this is what it looks like, not of course in York County, but to colleagues that you might bump into, is that there's a cool tool presented to the staff or to the teacher, even to the student. And possibly you might understand what the purpose of that tool is. Like, oh, here's Google Docs, or we're gonna do wikis this year, or oh, there's this really cool tool called Skype. And then teachers are allowed to make it fit in their classroom. And that's when staff development goes good. What happens the majority of time in the hundreds of schools that I'm in is this. Here's a cool tool. You get 20 minutes to see how it works. And now go back to your classroom on your own time, in your free time, because you know you have so much of that, and make it fit. And what happens is the following picture. This image was taken on a technology audit. The teacher actually knew that I was coming with the team to audit the integration of technology in their current curriculum and standards. This was a try to do. And like the Highlights Magazine, I'm gonna have you do a first look. And you remember that Highlights Magazine where you're like, what is wrong with that picture? And you have to circle all the things wrong with that picture. <laughs> so on first glance, I want you to turn to a neighbor and talk about what's wrong with that picture. And then I'll give you some insight into what's right with that picture. So turn and talk about that picture for a minute. Oh, one Feels so weird. So give me a thumbs up. We'll come up with something more original, but this is all I have at six in the morning. <laughs> so give me a thumbs up if you found some things that were interesting about that picture. So let me tell you the backstory, what's right with this picture. This is a veteran, a 28 year old educator, one of the most passionate educators that I've ever met in my 25 years in the field. And she was trying so hard to make it work, to make this cool tool, this smart tool fit. And every time she tried, she felt like she lost a little bit of herself. Because for 28 years, 25 years, she knew what she was doing. She came to school every day and she knew how to get the wow on kids' faces. And she knew how to love them and she knew how to talk to them and she knew how to help them love each other. And then she had to make this stuff fit. And she thought this was what made her the wow. She thought this is what was gonna keep the wow on their face. And so her default, where she didn't even know, is that every time she felt a little of her humanity and her heart slipping away, you could see an old piece of her creeping in. So yes, we'll do the smart board, but I'm gonna bring my like my little blankie, I'm gonna bring my little overhead projector into the mix too, because that just makes me feel a little bit less un uncertain in this really uncertain time. And this makes me happy when I see this, because it's a reminder that teachers are trying, that they are trying so desperately to make it fit, because they believe that the direction that will define their success in the 21st century is about the number of technology tools you have in your classroom or the latest and greatest that you're a 21st century school or teacher if you guys have this. And what they find is that quickly fading because the next thing is coming out two seconds from now. So the school down the road, not, not only has a computer lab, they have an iPad lab. 
Now the iPad lab has an iPad 2 lab. And so I'm here to remind you that it is not what is in your room. It's not what you plug into the wall that puts that smile on kids' face. It is you. It has always been you. It will always be you. And whatever it takes to make you fit into this classroom is what we have to do. A 21st century teacher comes into the room with that look on their face, keeps that look on the student's face, and everybody leaves with a day that's just a little bit more awesome. And it has nothing to do with technology, and it has everything to do with technology. So I'm going to give you a framework to help ensure the awesome. So I want you to turn and just talk about what's right with that picture for just a couple seconds, and then we'll move on to the framework. I can see you, you have to talk. Okay, the first technology mandate is to bring show and tell back to your classroom. I'm going to do my show and tell. As a former kindergarten teacher, this was the most critical time of the day. This is a guaranteed Olivia face on 33 five-year-olds. I feel like that every day. And the thing, one of the things that helps me put technology in perspective and keeps me understanding that I live and learn in the most awesome time in the whole world is sharing with students in real ways, impactful ways, with a global and local perspective. Technologies that honor individuals and, and community passion and amplifies the talents that we have in our presence. As I make sure that these collectively are a part of the living, breathing DNA of our classroom. I start the day in what I call learning now. So learning now, and, and you have this whole slide deck. So you don't have to take any notes. You get the entire slide deck, all the images, all the links. So I just want you to come into my classroom and start the day in the way that I would start it with you if I was there. What learning now is, as I said, is a show and tell version of the 21st century. And if you haven't taught kindergarten or been around a kindergartner for a while, this is how show and tell works. You get a very brief amount of time because five-year-olds would show and tell all day. And when I say all day, that means through lunch, through recess, after school, they would come before school if you let them just show and tell all the awesome things in their life. So you make a very short amount of time. This is literally 60 seconds. And all you do is balance how to, how to differentiate everything that you've encountered in the last 24 hours, because show and tell in kindergarten is every day. So that means it's a reboot of awesome every day. And so how do you manage to sift and sort the most extraordinary things that you've heard, that you've seen, that you've learned about, that you've discovered in the last 24 hours? And how do you get that down to a really short moment? From a technology perspective, what I am also modeling is the vast exponentiality in which genius and talent emerges in our world. Things that are literally invented every second, content that is created by the most genius minds in the world that has the potential to change our life happens every 60 seconds. The third thing I'm modeling in show and tell is how to build my attention muscles how to become a better listener, how to become an honorable sharer, how to be more focused, because each and every one of these will make you go, wow. And then you have to leave it. And you have to say, okay, I've got to get my report done, or I've got to do my math back, or I've got to get this, this, you know, this book um, read or written. So this is a very short amount of time, literally 60 seconds. And what I do is I share with learners what I have learned in the last 24 hours that made me go, wow. 
that put the Olivia face on me. So here it goes, my last 24 hours. This is, um, there is no name for it. And we are being asked by the scientific community to name it. It is to date the, the oldest living organism ever recorded in history. There is no kingdom that it fits into. So it is now having its own kingdom. It's not of the protozoan, it's not of the animal kingdom. It is the, li the oldest living organism. So scientists have opened up a dialogue for us to name together the oldest living organism. Because I follow the NASA stream, yesterday was a very exciting day. At 1.30 a.m., I woke up, I didn't wake up at 1.30, but I get an alert on my Twitter stream. And the discovery of, of Mars and all that could be there, this is water, which was never before thought existed on Mars. And it's a live 3D video stream of water flowing on Mars. What amount of time would that take to get into the book if you hadn't read the newspaper? This is live straight from the Mars stream, from the NASA stream, to help us be there at the moment they made this discovery. That is a wow. You should be saying wow right now. I should hear, see all your faces going, wow, wow. <laughs> um, this makes me go wow because I'm always carrying cords and I'm always losing stuff. Eric can attest to that because I called him last night and I'm like, oh, I left my mat cord at the other place. So can you please get me a mat cord? Soon that will be no longer. The little device in the center is your new super small smartphone and computer. That's holographic technology. So if I was on a plane, if I was on a bus, if I was outside walking in the woods, if I was at my desk, that keyboard and also a 22 inch giant screen is now holographic projection. That makes me go, wow. This is even more exciting. This is my new customizable theory. Again, holographic technology. So I was again lost yesterday. So I asked Siri on my phone, find me back to my hotel, but I didn't get to see her and I try to envision what she looks like. And she looks tall, dark, and handsome. So there, there is my tall, and my husband's sitting right here, so no offense, honey. But this is my new theory. So I have a human being that just says, you're not lost. I'll walk you here. I'll help you find this. Isn't that incredible? He's not done with the prototype yet, but he's coming. I still have a little more tweaking to do. This really made me go, wow. Apparently, it's about $19,000, so that's a little wow. This is not a hotspot. This is not a Wi-Fi. This is an entire cell phone tower, an entire cell phone tower that fits in the palm of your hand. It's $19,846. I'm sure in a few weeks it'll be down to about $17,000, $16,000. But can you imagine carrying, never, ever not having connection because you're carrying a cell phone tower in your hand? So that's just in the last 24 hours. If we look again there's a chance to get this space all over again. Now the point is not engagement because we are not state fair workers. We are not trying to engage children in the rides to come. We are trying to empower them. We are trying to remind them that they are living and breathing and learning in the most extraordinary time. And for not one second should we take advantage or take for granted anything that we have access to. This is a privilege and with privilege comes great responsibility. So it's important for us to know that the context of everything we do moves forward is exponential. There is more content, there is more wows created in the, in the next 60 seconds that we're sitting here together than the entire history of mankind. And that is expected to double every 61 days. So we're no shortage of wows. We should be hearing that as Eric walks through the halls, as you walk through the halls, you should be hearing that every day. Can you believe that? Where did you find that? Is that real? Is that available? Because then we aren't just teaching the standards, we're living the standards. Because every single, every single second, we have to be analyzing, evaluating, critiquing, making decisions about, justifying. We have to be looking for authenticity. We have to be comparing and contrasting. 
we don't say on Thursday, third semester, quarter two at 1045, we're going to compare and contrast. We're doing that every single living, breathing moment, and we're living these standards. So I just want you to turn and talk for a moment. If you take nothing away in terms of technology integration or this tool or that tool, what would life be like if every day in every classroom, learners, especially led by you, started sharing what they were wowed by in the last 24 hours? Talk about that for a second. And I don't know if you have capacity to take the mic or somebody does, but if you have a question and someone wants to take the mic, I would be happy to answer. And remember, I can see you, so you have to talk. There's literally you talking. Nothing. It's so weird. I have to see real quick when I get in the chat. Give me a thumbs up if you can find a use for that. If you can find 60 seconds in your day to do some of that sharing. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So this framework isn't just um, a cute thing that I put together for our, for our conversation today. It literally is my rubric, my decision-making rubric, my learning rubric, my, my teaching rubric. Some of the most important technologies, a pen is a technology. A post-it note is a technology. If you ask me to give up post-it notes right now, I, did, I couldn't even speak about it. So anything that brings human beings to their fullest capacity is an evolution in technology. Chalk was a technology. So when I look at getting technology right, I look at what it does for the human beings using the technology. Does it help? make the learning more real? Does it make it more realistic, more authentic? And does it position the learning in real time? Does it make an impact on the learner, on, uh, on both the recipient and the giver? Does it give the learner or the community a more global perspective? And by global, I don't mean you have to be connecting with another world. Anyone who changes your local perspective it could be somebody in the city next door. It could be somebody in the town. It could be somebody in the next grade level. When we globalize our perspective, we open it up to different eyes and to different lenses and to different hearts. Does the work that we're doing honor one another's passion? Does it propel us to do more work that matters? Does it amplify the talents in our presence? And does it give us access to others where we can be um, inspired and embody talent that is being used in powerful and purposeful ways. This is not only a decision for how I organize my day with students, it's a decision on what kinds of technologies I would put money towards, that I would spend time in. So I mean, I have nothing, I have nothing against, um, let's say, Globster, for example. but. It isn't about is Globster a good tool or not. It is my use of Globster, is my use of Skype, or is my use of a wiki, or is my use of a pencil um, getting me to that. This is my criteria, not the technology. So let me show you what this looks like as I move throughout the classroom. I'm going to give you a quiz, and I'm going to tell you at the end. So I want you to actually write down on a piece of paper. I recently shared this framework with uh, an auditorium full of middle and high school students. And I gave them this criteria. And I asked them to think about the way they use technology in their life and the way they use technology in school. And what is the one of all five of these criteria, what's the one most critical criteria 
to be met in school, what was most important for them. If technology was going to be used in the lesson or the learning, it had to do this, and they picked one thing above all others. It wasn't like a close race between the R and the H. The race was this far with a clear winner in one of the five. So I want you to write that down, and at the end, I'm going to come back and see if you can pick what students said. What was the most important, and remind me to circle back around that, um, the most important criteria. If we did this, we would have them. We would have them at hello. <laughs> All right, so let's go through the framework. Many times when we bring students to the web, we position it or their perception is it's just a large digital library. Instead of getting content, it's a place where you get stuff. Instead of getting content from a library, you just get content the same as a library in digital format through the computer screen. So that puts you as a learner in a position of passivity, that if I have to go in, I have to get stuff and, and bring it to me. I don't have any power in what stuff I get or what form it's in, it's already sort of predetermined for me that it's static. Because if you walk into a library and you see something on a shelf, you get what you pull out. It's static. It has a beginning. It has a middle. It has an end. We're positioning the web with that same sort of perception and behavior that I just go to Google and I get stuff when that is far, far, far from the truth. In the first evolution of the web, Web 1.0, that was accurate. At the beginning of the web, which was decades ago, it was a digitized content reservoir. Oops, this is not playing. Maybe it is. No, it didn't play. So what this is, and you'll have the link to this, is a real time. It's one of the first lessons that I do with students and teachers. It is, it's called Gary Media, Gary's Social Media Counter. And it is a ticker tape by the second of what the inside of the web looks like. How much content is dynamically evolving every one second of the web? Because that's the first misconception that we have to get over is that we're dealing, that, that real learning is about living in a dynamic space. It's about not learning to drive in a parking lot but learning to drive when the road underneath you changes while you're driving on it. And that's a really, really important context because when we teach competency, let's take driving, my son is 16, he thinks he's a great driver. He's even told me how many hours he's put in driving all summer. Mom, I'm really good now. I put in 400 hours driving. I said, you've been driving on a country road, on a back road that is straight, to school, to home, to school, to home. There's no traffic on that road. There's one stop sign on that road. It's a two-mile stretch. You could drive that 10,000 hours, and I still wouldn't put you on the highway in Des Moines, let alone in the middle of New York City during high traffic time. So your navigation abilities, your ability to manage your environment is contextual. We're teaching kids how to swim in a baby pool, and then they are entering the ocean. That looks very calm but is dynamically changing. And if you don't understand how to handle those dynamics, those waves, those currents, you will get swept under. So I need kids to understand they are not getting content that's static. They are participating with content that is changing every moment. Here's the benefit. You get the wisdom of the crowd that you're not getting what one individual or group of individuals wrote about a minute ago, a decade ago, hundreds of years ago. You are getting collective intelligence from individuals that are thinking about and managing and researching that piece of content or that area 10 seconds ago in real time. Real time, real task, real talk. What used to take me at the basement of my university on microfish doing my dissertation, hundreds of hours and a lot of quarters to try to figure out what people said 100 years ago about how I should teach. 
can be done in a matter of minutes on the web. I send a link and say, I, I need to know the most current on this topic. And I don't have me in the basement of a university searching. I have hundreds of people searching, analyzing, evaluating, filtering information. Clay Shirky said this the best. We are not suffering from information overload. We are suffering from filter failure. And the only way to manage the kind of information coming at us dynamically is to understand that it will be the crowd that will be your Google. You have to know that the smartest person in the room is the room. And you have to know how to tap into the wisdom of the room. There's very small ways that we can start doing that. I'm not asking you to have a child send a tweet out and say, oh, tell me about the Revolutionary War and sort that. So this site is down right now, but it's down often and it keeps coming up. So one of my favorite ways to help kids understand the power of the wisdom of the room, and it also is about where the room is. So this is a site called Ask 500. And so you get rewarded for the smartness of your question. So if you ask something stupid, like um, what color is Red Riding Hood's coat, no one is gonna take the time to help you curate sources about that. So you get rewarded for asking good questions. So if you see, it's enabled with Google Maps. So if I ask a question about harnessing energy on farms, and I get most of my responses from Hawaii, or I get most of my responses from Alaska, or I get most of my responses from Iowa, I also understand that geolocation is an important part of helping me filter. It isn't just about the content, it's about who is answering, who's contributing, who's collecting. And then you get better because your goal is to get 500 people to respond to your question. So you get real time and you can click on any of those and you can hear and see what they wrote as the answer. It helps kids understand that you're not trying to manage this content on your own that you are trying to strategically use and garner the wisdom of the crowd, and that you're not just analyzing and evaluating a source, you're actually analyzing and evaluating the, the, the contribution of a network. How valid is the network who gave you that source? So I want you to just say a couple words about that, and if anybody has, only one microphone can be used at a time. Oh, okay, I'm just reading on the thing. I, was, I got a message from, um, anyway. So any, any thoughts or questions about that? And the site again is down right now, but it goes down and up all the time. And you can try this without technology, just in your school. Schools like Poll Everywhere. That's just the first part of awesome, of this dynamic, ever-changing space. If you look at Web 1.0, it is the access to information, the ability to, to be able to access, have access to the web. Web 2.0 is the ability to access and interact with the content. And again, not only the content, but the individuals contributing the content. Where in the world could you interact with the presidents of the United States and be able to share and react to content that he is contributing in real time and you're watching him contribute it? <laughs> and the same goes for the astronauts. When I was with a group of students, when astronaut Mike went into the air, into the shuttle, he was live tweeting. The very first picture where he said, you know, one step for mankind, he said one tweet for mankind because he tweeted when he set foot on the moon. So all of this was done interacting with the content. The extraordinary part isn't just access to massive amount of content that's already crowdsourced, it's that you get to participate in the creation and reaction of that content. That's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. But probably the most extraordinary is the evolution of Web 3.0, which helps you understand that you're not just accessing, getting access to the web, you're not just interacting with the web, you are the web. 
and that the content you create changes the web and the world. This is a radio show, a blog radio show, that a school I work with outside of Nebraska, literally in the middle of a cornfield, has more hits. This is kindergarten through fifth graders broadcasting to the world every week what they have understood, what they're learning across all their content areas. Their radio show has a million hits a week, which is more than the local radio show. People are tuning in every day to be wowed by what these individuals have learned and curated and connected on the extreme line. This is done for kids, by kids, and their audience is not kids. Their audience is the world. Their contributions are impacting the world. That's the R. Real talk, real time, real contributions. That's what it means to be alive in this age of content. The I is knowing that those interactions can make an impact, can make an impact on your learners, on your learning, and on your lives. The first lesson that I shared um, with students and with teachers to help them understand that their contributions aren't just another ticker in the amount of content that's created, like in the next 60 seconds, your class you know, created this, that you create content with the understanding that you want to make an impact. You're not just writing a report and slapping it up on a large school wall or on a big refrigerator. You're doing it to impact other people. And that's really hard to make the switch that what you do in a little school room in Iowa or in the middle of Virginia could impact the global community. But it does. So this is the first, um, the first thing that kids see when they come into my classroom. When I work with teachers. I ask them to understand that the work you're doing here today is about the world, that you are a genius and the world needs your contribution. And the key word there is need. It doesn't want your contribution. The world needs your contribution. The mantra on my blog is you are, we are smarter together. That is not just a cute saying. I mean that. The moment we start thinking that we own the learning and that we are the smart ones or that we as an individual can be the only one who is expert on that topic or that area the moment we lose out on the wisdom of the crowd. So this is an, an absolute disposition and mindset that you have to understand you and me are part of we. And to be a part of we means every member of the community must make a contribution. For the room to be smart, the room has to contribute. So, this is a group of young writers, and rather than writing a five-paragraph essay and sticking it on the wall, and all the paragraphs look the same and nobody reads them because they're just writing with no mind and no purpose and, and no audience in mind, and certainly not with the intention to make an impact, but just the intention to get done. Um, we spent two weeks scouring the web for writing in different formats that made an impact on people. Writing that people reacted to, writing that people shared, writing in every form and every medium. And we spent collecting what made that writing wow people. So wow stands for worthy of the world. What made that writing worth someone's attention? Because when you see the ticker tape, what you'll realize when content is coming at you like this, it's not just overwhelming to think I've got to manage that. You have six to 11 seconds on the web to capture somebody's attention. And you do that by capturing their heart. If you capture someone's heart, you have a chance at their attention. You must secure the heart before you have a shot at the brain. So that's the thing that they notice. All of the writing that captured someone's attention, not just for an individual to read it in the bazillion hits of content, but for it to be shared, because that's the rubric. If the writing is shared, then people notice it. So I know you can't completely see this chart, but they said, these are some of the criteria these five-year-olds came up with, three pages. The writing has to be passionate. The writing has to be a story. The writing has to be your story. Nobody wants you to tell somebody else's story. The writing has to be unique. The writing has to show that you put your time in, that you did your homework. The writing has to be something that people know you worked hard on. It has to come from your heart. 
three pages of that content, and they are spot on. Writing that is impactful, writing that is, and, and anything, not just writing, but art, music, video, has every one of those criteria, none of them non-negotiable. So I use technology in this sense because I knew these students were working on believing that their writing was worthy of the world. I had sent a tweet out earlier that morning, and I told the world, hang on, get ready to be wild. We've got some writing coming your way. I had no idea who was going to respond, so I put it on a big screen, and I used a tool called TweetFall, and it makes your tweet stream like fall like raindrops. And I unveiled it, and I said, oh, by the way, you guys, I know that your writing is worthy of the world, but I also wanted you to know the world is waiting for your contribution. And they're like, really? Is my mom going to read this? Is my teacher going to? I said, no, 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 no. The world is waiting for your contribution. So on the back screen, the first tweet was from Bahrain. And they're like, you know, dear, dear writers, we're so waiting to be wowed by you. And the kids are like, where's Bahrain? And I go, I don't know, but they're waiting for your contribution. And then like the next one was Uzbekistan. And they're like, Where's this Pakistan? And I go, I don't know, but they're waiting for your contribution. And it just kept coming from Moosehead, Montana, from Clive, Iowa, from New York City, from Saskatchewan, Canada, from all over the world. People were saying, I am waiting for your contribution. Then the kids got freaked out and they're like, okay, tell them we'll be giving it to them in about two weeks because we have to go back over and make sure all of our writing reaches that criteria, and they wrote at recess, and they wrote at the beginning of the day, and they came in early, and they stayed late, and they went over their lunch hour because they were so getting that the world really was waiting for their contribution. This is not just a kid thing. The same thing happened to teachers a few weeks ago. I was at a conference, much like the one you're having, and these were teachers that said, the most naughty word in the whole world, it's the word just. If you put the word just in front of something, it is like you're going to go to detention because this is what I heard. I'm just a teacher. Who's going to care what I have to say? I'm just an elementary school principal. Who's going to know? Who cares what my, you know, second grade teachers are doing? I'm just a school board member. No one's going to listen to what I have to say. And, and then I had to send them to detention because just is not acceptable. So we want you to make a big thing. We will never say the word just because you are not just anything. You are a genius. So the teacher still didn't believe me. So I did the same thing. I said, I don't, I just want you, and I just said the word just, I'm sorry. Um, I want you to share what it is that you think would be helpful to the world. I want you to share something you've heard or something you know about or something that will help you. And I promise you, the world is waiting for your contribution. So for about 30 minutes, they did that. And then I showed them this slide. And this takes my breath away. They sent not just one tweet. They sent 563 tweets total. Those tweets generated 769,000 impressions, which means they touched 769,000 other learners, but this is more, most important. They reached and brought in a new audience to the conversation of 110,000 people. It changed the entire rest of the conference. Teachers were not just going, oh, I had coffee for breakfast. I had cream in my tea. I had all of this. They started going, oh my gosh, just like the second, just like the first graders, I better step up because the world is needing that resource. Because other teachers, 110,000 of them in the world, need to know that that's the best place to get information on QR codes. Because if I put this here, then somebody else is going to be able to use this. And the moment they understood that their contribution not only was worthy of the world, but it was expected and wanted by the world, it changed everything in a millisecond. And I'm going to say the same thing to you. In fact, I'm going to ask you to say that to your neighbor right now and mean it. Even though I can't hear you, I'll be able to test your expressions. I want you to tell the neighbor next to you, you are a genius, and the world needs your contribution. Go ahead. I'm going to be watching your body language, so you have to mean it. Oh, they look so cute. They 
दे रहा है ताकि हम्म हम्म ओ ना तो ये बट है ना सब सही है नहीं नहीं बता रहा कोई बात नहीं Okay, Eric is probably yelling at me in the back and he's like, "You just have 15 minutes." So, I'm going to move to the next slide. I just so lost track of time. So, I'm going to share we have some time questions at the end. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, it uh, this is a, a message from I'll have to relinquish the microphone. I will do that. I will relinquish the microphone. So I will move quickly through this. I want to share a global project to give you a sense of what bringing global does. Um, this is a typical fourth grade project where we had to do this. I had to do this in fourth grade a long time ago, where you had to write about your state. You had to write what the state bird is, who, which I really didn't care. I had to write what our state produces, corn. I had to, you know, put what the state flower is and make this report and make a poster board and it went on the wall. with 100 other kids who wrote the same thing about the same state. So, taking it global isn't just saying write your report about your state on a PowerPoint or put your report about the state and make a glossary of it. It's about using technology to make an impact with that information about your state. So, these students pick not just states, they pick five places in the world that they were interested in knowing about. and through Skype they hooked up with these students in these classrooms and instead of writing the state report their challenge was is to pitch or sell their state or country to somebody who wasn't there which means anything that can be looked up on Google could not be in the report it had to be something that only a person that lived there and learned there and loved there would be able to share and so this was also not simply just to be static this was going to be a legacy project where every year the next class would contribute with the dream that this would be the fourth grade curriculum for states and countries so that i could click on southern africa and instead of seeing some encyclopedic contribution from somebody who doesn't love and live in africa i would get this i would get a voice thread with real time interviews with real photographs and real essence of individuals who lived there who'd been interviewed who shared their stories and they would be living breathing documents that had more information than any encyclopedia could possibly have about what life is like in that region in that country in that state this is more than a book report with technology this is a living breathing legacy of history in real time So this was year one. This would be the next year. There are three more classrooms doing it. So imagine this board right here will be lit up with real living history. And if you think about, well, I want to visit this place in the world, or I want to visit Iowa. Are you going to Google Iowa? Are you going to take and listen to one of these voice threads that interview and and live and tell the story? from the perspective of the community of what life in in Iowa or Canada or Virginia is like that's what taking it global means that's what taking it global does i'm going to combine the next two and then open it up for questions technology first and foremost should be about honoring passion and amplifying talent sorry about that so honoring passion is more than just giving kids technologies and tools it's giving them a reason to want to use the tool a reason to discover what their genius is and contribute it to the world this is a very very special hour i positioned a schedule in the passion book last year that's based on google's model of innovation and creativity or it's called the 20% project where 4 days a week all of the google engineers designers coders marketers 
brilliant geniuses do their normal work. They go to their department, they work really hard, and on one day a week, 20% of their time, all of the geniuses get a day to create a project and pull together in any way they want with the full resources of Google to contribute something that impacts the community or changes the world. That's their only caveat. You can have this day, you can have this 20%, but it has to impact the world or change our community. So last year, we've been testing out what would that genius hour look like in school. There is now an entire network of teachers in schools participating in genius hours where they are giving students and they are giving space and time to individuals and allowing our kids to pull together and tackle real world problems with real world solutions. What surprised many of the teachers, including myself, is that when you give genius a reason, it shows up. So here's an example of some of the projects kids have been tackling. This is a young lady that's leading a group of dream team, other 11 year olds, and they've created a nonprofit foundation called Project Yesu that's raised $24,000 to buy school supplies for kids in Uganda. This is her first passport because there's enough money raised where she's flying to Uganda to meet the first seven children that she sponsors. Last year during Genius Hour, these 11 fifth graders helped me pull 122,000 classrooms in 65 countries together to fight global illiteracy. During Genius Hour this year, a group of grade three students actually are building a library for these children in a school across the world. And they're doing it via Skype and they're watching the construction and they've raised the money and fundraised in the country and they're actually watching the physical library being built. All this took was time, trust and belief. This is both honoring passion and giving them a chance to amplify what their talent is. Is their talent making a movie? Is their talent pulling a team together? Is their talent um, creativity? Is their talent music? Whatever their talent is, there is a need for it in the world. Genius Hour is also requiring very special competencies. So this is what Google does. It says, this is my genius, this is my expertise, and I'm willing to lend it to be a part of anyone's dream team. So if I needed a Google app to make my project go, or if I needed a voice thread to be able to do that work, or if I needed a photo application, I can go to a list school-wide and I can say, here's my project, during this hour, I'm gonna need Brandon, I'm gonna need Peter, I'm gonna need Yuri, I'm gonna need Sandy, and I gotta pull them together. And so the time is open where I can pull my dream team from any grade, any school, any place, because they are the ones who have the competencies, these are the experts waiting to help. And this can be school-wide, this can be grade level-wide, it is possible, the talent that exists is in your school and in your classroom already. It is waiting to be amplified. When we position the technology that we do under that context to help kids understand that there is something that the world needs, that our classroom needs, everything changes. Everything changes for students. And the question that I want to close with is the answer to the question I gave. What is it that kids want most from you from me, from the world. And rather than asking you, I ask kids. This is a representative of a half a million kids. At South by Southwest, I was part of an interview process that asked one half a million students, 500,000 students, what is the most important thing they want out of their 21st century education? And in unison, they said two words. I want to know that I matter. I want to hear these two words, you matter. As I probed further by interviewing hundreds and hundreds of students, I said, what do teachers need to do to show you that you matter? Be very specific. And so these were a group of students that represented those interviews. You show me that I matter. You show me not just by telling me, you show me by smiling at me, by noticing me, by helping me, by empowering me, 
by honoring me, by believing in me, and most importantly, by trusting me. Give me time to do what I know I'm capable of doing and believe that I can do it. And I promise you, you can expect great things. So, Eric, do you have the video that is a message from kids? And then we can answer some questions. Okay, awesome. And that was I, the, the final answer of what kids wanted most is for technology to be the t talent amplifier. Because they said if we don't use technology to matter, then what's the point? And I agree. So, Eric? You can expect great things from me. I am on a mission. I wonder. I dream. I create. I am smart. I am kind. I am special. I am important. I am somebody. I am loved. I am cared for. I am ready for tomorrow. I'm creating the future. I am the future. You matter to my mission. Are you ready to help me change the world? Tomorrow starts today. Expect great things. You matter to me. Thanks, Angela. Um, so, you all, we have time for a couple questions, and so I know uh, help us uh, help us overcome the awkwardness of connecting with so someone uh, via the video conferencing and being brave enough to ask the question even though she's not physically here. So, what questions do you have that we can pose to Angela this morning? Good morning. You mentioned the issue of time, and I think as leaders we all struggle with providing the time for not just ourselves, but especially our teachers to explore technology as the tool. Do you have ideas for that? Lynn, will you type that in case she does not appear um, presently? I think but I think you asked about time. Um, there's never enough of it. And what I found is that if you can't, that's why it was not a whole day like Google. Um, it was one hour. So one hour a week to do work that matters, to do it with people on topics and issues that matter. What happened is that kids put in 50 times that amount of time, that they did it way beyond that hour. And so you don't just, I mean, if you think about an hour, even if it is once every couple weeks, it's the consistency of giving time that when they do work that matters, it's often in a project format. And I'm, I'm very passionate about project-based learning. But again, authenticity is from, from a world perspective that you don't just have a one-time contribution. You don't just do a project and now you go back to the, the real work. This cannot be seen as something extracurricular. It, it is the core of your curriculum to work on work that matters and that it becomes a reason that you need to know math and the reason that you need to know science because you need it for the work that matters. So having a consistent flow, even though I know an hour is an extraordinary amount of time, is, has been the most transformational thing for students. And it's such an integration of, you don't have to then have a technology lab, you don't have to, there's so many skills that you're doing in that hour it actually helps you save time. And I can sprint to that side too if someone has <laughs> you've got one as well. Hi. 
Hi. Um, I have a question about WOW. Um, I'm a little concerned about how, as a high school teacher, would I get my students to share their WOW? Are they WOWing about the world, or are they supposed to WOW about my content area? How do you set parameters for WOW as a secondary teacher? Okay. So how do you structure the WOW experience? The, the experience isn't WOW. The acronym is helping them understand that what they're doing is worthy of the world. So WOW stands for worthy of the world. So it isn't that the project is worthy of the world. It's that their contribution is worthy. And when, when they know that the world is going to be listening to or reading or viewing their contribution, it automatically makes a human being step up, just like it makes five-year-olds step up and it makes teachers step up. If you know that you're presenting into the abyss or that it would be like a great example is I use sports examples a lot, which is so funny since I know nothing about them, but how hard would players practice if there would be no one in the stands ever? Would they give their heart? Would they give their soul? Would they sweat and, and hurt and, and go to two practices a day just because they love the game? It's about the contribution. It's about knowing that people live are going to be watching and keeping score of your contribution. We look at that competition as something that's really negative. But can you imagine even a, a t-ball team saying, you know what, we're not going to keep score? a high school championship team. You know what? You're just really good players, and your contribution does matter, but nobody's going to see it, and we're not going to keep score. So it's that same performance. When you perform out loud and you know the world is watching, there is no rubric that school could put on that that would step up to the rubric that the world puts on it. And that's real-time um, authentic assessment because the judge of your A, if you will, is how people react to your content. Students will be defined by the contribution they make, how they play the game in real time. There's no game tape. It's all real time performance. So that's the wow, is give them an audience to present their work to. So if you're a high school writing teacher, put real writing out there with real feedback from, from other writing communities. If it is science, Contribute your content to the real scientific community. If it is engineering, contribute your content to real engineers. So that, that's the litmus test. And no, by doing that in a real community of peers and of discipline, you will understand that you're worthy because the web doesn't ask you for a height or a weight or a grade level or a, a, a background. They just say, I want a contribution that matters. And they don't say it doesn't matter because you're only five. It says it matters and I'll take it. And that's a huge difference between school and the world. The world is a tribe and every member counts. School is a hierarchy. And you only count if you're at this grade or at this height or whatever. You're an immediate team member. Eric, did you tell them about Dot Day? Um, am I on camera or not? I have not. No, I have not. I don't think I'm on the mic. Uh, yeah, no. I have not shared that. So, um, Aunt okay. So this is our our global invite, and I don't know where the. Let's go back here. On. And Eric will talk to you more about this. I was so wanting to do this in person. But as Eric showed the book this morning, The Dot, um, our first step in helping you and helping your students understand that they are worthy of the world and inviting them to make their mark on the world is we are asking you and your classrooms and your students to participate in making our dot together so that when we make a dot, and we connect those, it really has world-changing power. So on September 15th, the world is going to be sharing the dot story with one another. We will be using Skype and the Skype network to help organize those conversations at the very 
least, or I shouldn't say at the very least, at the very um, earliest uh, structure of that, you would be asking or finding another community. It could be another classroom. It could be another school. It could be another country to share that story with one another back and forth via the Skype network. And it's as creative as you want. If you want to share that story with another third grade classroom or another high school classroom, or if the high school wants to share it with a third grade classroom, it's important that it's a community dialogue in the community telling one another that they matter and that their mark is important. And it's important for us, for you to sign up for the Skype network because we did this last year and we invited kids and schools to read stories to one another to share a global dialogue about, about their life and about their learning. And we had a Google Doc. This was the Google Doc and it wasn't searchable. So imagine trying to find out of 600 teachers in this Google Doc, another classroom that fits you, that matches what your goals are. So we're asking you to sign up on the Skype for Educators Network because they're building a searchable database so that you can actually have some control and say, I'm in Iowa, I'm in Virginia, this is the time zone, here's what I'd like to share back and forth, here's what our class is looking for, and a Google Doc is our very best bet. So Eric and I will be giving you more directives for that. Oops, sorry. Um, and now this is totally messed up. So we're just going to leave it off screen. But we're really excited, and I'm very excited that this will, this is the beginning of our story and our, our collective dot at York, and that I will be there in person, I promise, um, multiple times this year, and I can't wait to meet you in person. You're already a very important part of my life, and I've only met six of you. So... I just am very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you, Eric, for your dot. <laughs> well, well, Angela, thank you for inspiring us uh, this morning in terms of our, our journey of really in, in engaging kids in opportunities that allows the, allow them to make a difference. So please join me in uh, thanking Angela.